Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, Epicenter Psychosis Speaker Series. Delighted to introduce our distinguished speaker today, Dr. Lena Palaniopin. Dr. Palaniopin is a professor of psychiatry and medical biophysics uh, at Western University in London, Ontario. Uh, and today we'll be talking about uh, a key issue in our work here around early intervention, which is, is critical as we look to optimize uh, our interventions and develop new ones to uh, help people in the recovery process from these illnesses. And that issue is around mechanisms. What should be our mechanistic focus in our early intervention efforts? Uh, as always, questions uh, can be submitted in the chat feature and we'll have a Q&A at the end with Dr. Palaniopin. And closed captioning is also available by selecting the uh, closed captioning option on the bottom of the screen. With that, I'm delighted to turn this over to our distinguished speaker today, Dr. Lena Palaniopin. Thank you very much, Nick. Thanks for that introduction. I'm very glad to be with all of you. I've watched a number of hosted videos on your website and I always enjoyed learning new things from uh, the speaker series. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, this is me. I'm a psychiatrist by practice. Uh, I run an early intervention team here in London, Ontario. I also do a lot of brain imaging work, I'm mostly focused on early phases of psychosis. So today's talk is primarily going to be on combining both of these aspects, the clinical aspect of early intervention and discoveries that you do with brain imaging. So I'm going to focus on what should be our mechanistic focus for early intervention in, in psychiatry. Um, so uh, the, the talk is actually a summary of a couple of recent um, publications. Uh, one is an editorial that came uh, late last year in the Canadian Journal of Neuropsychopharmacology. It's called JPN, Journal of Psychiatry and Neuroscience. And the editorial uh, written by myself and a resident, a psychiatry resident, was on reconsidering tissue changes, brain tissue changes, as the mechanistic focus for early intervention in, in psychiatry. Uh, and a couple of weeks ago, I also had a commentary uh, published in the Australia and New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry. Uh, this is focused on uh, neuroscience of early intervention and how do we move beyond appealing to the fear that something is happening to the brain, let's intervene early. So I'm going to summarize these two aspects and, and talk as I go along. Uh, and most of the work I'm going to show today uh, has been done uh, either in the UK, where I used to work five years ago uh, in Nottingham, um, as well as uh, with the collaborators here locally, especially uh, Jean Taberge and Rob Bartha, biophysicists who helped us to to get good quality spectroscopy data here in uh, London, Ontario. Um, I also want to mention uh, specifically uh, some of the collaborators I have in uh, Changsha um, as well as in uh, Shanghai and some of the data that you will see today uh, are from uh, collected in China. Uh, I also want to thank the funders who make this kind of work possible uh, in psychosis, primarily CHR, the Canadian Institute of Health Research, as well as uh, while I was in the UK, some of this work was funded by Wellcome Trust as well as MRC in the UK. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, I've been um, part of advisory board membership for Otsuka Canada, as well as uh, received speaker honorarium from Otsuka and Janssen. And uh, I'm one of the members of the editorial board in the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry, as well as the Journal of Psychiatry and Neuroscience, JPN Journal. So uh, the talk is going to uh, focus on three areas. One is revisiting the concept of early intervention. And from uh, what I learned from your group, uh, most of you are practicing early intervention. Uh, so this is going to be just a rehash and uh, you know, rejiggling of your memory of early intervention concepts um, rather than anything new. Um, and then I'll uh, visit the concept of progressive changes in the brain um, in, in psychosis. And let's think about that in much more detail today. And finally, I'll close by um, putting out some data that, that might make you think, rethink the brain basis of early intervention. Uh, so we'll start with uh, the effectiveness of early intervention. Um, there is no need to make a neuroscientific case for early intervention. Uh, it doesn't matter what happens in the brain, early intervention works. And we all know this. Um, and, you know, we've been practicing this, so we, we're all, I think, uh, the converts, so we don't have to get any preaching about early intervention. Uh, but, uh, you know, this paper that I want to just uh, highlight here was done by Kelly Anderson, one of the epidemiologists who, who works with us here in London, Ontario. Uh, this was published three years ago in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Uh, 
And this, this paper I highlight often because it gives you a one single tangible number for you to carry in your head when you communicate with your colleagues and tell them about how effective early intervention is. Now, generally we know it reduces symptoms. Uh, we can help the patients and families um, earlier so that they don't have to suffer longer. So there's a lot of social psychological benefits. But what is the public health impact of early intervention? This is exactly what Kelly Anderson showed here. She looked at 17 years of our clinic's administrative data, um, longitudinal database. She looked at, uh, looked at it for 17 years of worth of data and she came up with the uh, classification of people who were eligible for early intervention and received it, and people who were eligible but did not come through our clinic. They lived in the same city, same geographical area. So she looked at how outcomes diverged between these groups, those who entered early intervention and those who did not. And she computed that for every um, 40 patients that we serve in an early intervention setting, we are actually reducing mortality by number one. So one in 40 is the number needed to treat to prevent death in this age group. Remember, this is not the age group that dies very often. This is a young individual, so death is uncommon event. And by intervening in 40 psychotic individuals, having a, a caseload of 40, you're reducing one untimely death. And that's a remarkable number when it comes to uh, reducing death rate. So this is a number I, I often highlight. Of course, she also showed that there are other benefits of early intervention. You reduce uh, the time people wait for seeing a psychiatrist. You reduce the number of times people use the emergency services to seek help. So all of these are known benefits, but a very important benefit to carry in our, our own minds is uh, we also reduce death rates in this age group by intervening early. So we don't need a, a brain basis for early intervention. Uh, this is a case that's well made already. But why do we need neuroscience then? What's the point of thinking about neuroscience? So I, I generally use these two terms. Uh, these are somewhat of a layperson terms, but it helps us to understand the, the need for neuroscience. There are two phenomena you observe in early intervention settings, and this is universal. Uh, it's not just uh, in Canada or the UK or in the US. Uh, universal, universally, you see two phenomena. One, longer the DUP, longer the duration of untreated psychosis, poorer the outcomes. Patients don't do well when they come late. Now, I call this, uh, I use the lay, layperson uh, phrase, late commerce penalty. You come late, you're going to be penalized when you come late to the early intervention group, early intervention clinics. So that late commerce penalty, we don't really know what is the mechanistic basis of this late commerce penalty. Why the same treatment that works for a punctual early comer doesn't work for a late comer? It's a very important question. We don't know the answer for that. Number two, you know, as you see in your own practice, you, you, you might start working with an young individual, you might start helping them, get them out of hospital, they get better, uh, you treat them, they stay on the treatment, sometimes, sometimes they don't. But even if they stay on treatment, uh, you cannot completely prevent relapses in this, in this group. Um, we don't have any foolproof relapse prevention uh, treatments yet uh, in, in real life. Of course, when you give people um, uh, antipsychotics, they reduce the risk of relapse. They just completely don't eliminate it. So in other words, when people start, um, start early intervention treatment, they get better. But after a while, the, at least in some uh, subgroup of patients who go through early intervention, they don't they don't seem to uh, hold the capital that they gain early on. They get into relapses for various reasons, um, you know, maybe proximal or distal reasons, various reasons people get into relapses. And these relapses over time accumulate and lead to deficits and lead to the chronic schizophrenia-like picture in, in some of our patients. So that is a, that's a very important problem. In fact, this is the issue for which we started early intervention movement. Uh, we want to stop this from happening, but still we see people going through this kind of uh, deterioration within our clinical groups. So uh, we need to understand that. I call this as a loss of capital problem. We invest some capital in individuals with psychosis. They invest something in us, but over time, this capital withers away. Why should this happen? What is the reason behind these recurrences? Uh, despite treatment, why do people get recurrences? And why recurrences lead to resistance? And why does resistance then leads to uh, functional deterioration? So these are the questions that we need to really understand. And this is where neuroscience comes. So I believe the mechanism behind these phenomena should be the critical focus of early intervention in neuroscience. And we need really specific modes of early intervention so that we can address these problems. Right now, what do we do by early intervention is we take treatments that have been clinically trialed in later life, um, later stages of illness. 
chronic schizophrenia, for example, or acute stages of chronic schizophrenia, for example, we, we, have, we know that antipsychotics work in those stages. We take those antipsychotics and we transpose those antipsychotics to early stages of psychosis. In other words, any lead time that we gain by giving early access to patients, that lead time uh, is, is used to provide the same treatment that we would have provided later on in this patient's life. Uh, this to me is, is transposition of treatment rather than true early intervention that is phase specific or stage specific. So this is where neuroscience of the early stages becomes very important. So we can design and discover new ways of treating this illness so that there is no late commerce penalty, so, so that there is no loss of capital after we start early intervention. So I will, I will uh, take you through some of the ideas around this, these concepts. We'll start with, you know, whenever we want to look at the future, uh, we have to look back into the, into the past. So we'll start with this man, uh, he's Wilhelm Greisinger. Some of you might have heard of him. Um, we don't generally associate this name with early intervention, um, but uh, I think some of the stuff that he uh, mentioned early on in his uh, writings uh, are very resonant with the idea of early intervention. Um, he's the one who uh, promoted this um, notion that there is a progressive pathology that happens in, in psychosis. Uh, and even before the times of, uh, you know, later writings uh, of Kreplin. So he wrote a book on mental pathology and therapeutics. Uh, and in that book, he says this, this is a translation from, uh, from German. He's a Ge he was a German uh, psychiatrist who trained in Switzerland, worked in Germany and France, but he wrote his books in German. So this is a translation. Uh, he says, it generally happens that with patients who fall into insanity, the attacks as time advances become longer and more serious and the lucid intervals become shorter and with each new attack the prognosis becomes less favorable so this was his observation 100 years ago unfortunately this may still hold true i think so um this is a this idea of something happens and when it repeatedly happens there is progression and there is deterioration is well established in the field uh, in fact, Willem Greisinger is the person who uh, came up with the idea there's only one psychosis. You don't have to subclassify it. There is a unitary psychotic condition. And he argued for it uh, throughout his writing. Now, this is, a, you know, is this an outlier German observation or does this still hold true in the modern times after antipsychotics have been discovered? This was written when there was no antipsychotics. So this is recent data, uh, well, reasonably recent data uh, from uh, Robin Emsley, as well as uh, Stefan Leuchts meta-analysis, one of the many meta-analysis. So let me uh, take you through these two uh, pictures. Number one from Robin Emsley in South Africa. This is um, the, uh, the idea of what happens when you treat the same patient with the same antipsychotic for the first episode versus the second episode. So what you see here in this picture is in this graph, on top, you see the response for second episode. On the bottom, you see the response for first episode. And on the y-axis is the PAN score, and on the bottom is the, the time span. So uh, within four weeks, the first episode patients respond by 20 to 30% after you start the antipsychotic. Same person, same antipsychotic, even higher doses in the second time. When you administer the, the medication for the same patient, for the second episode, the response is very sluggish, doesn't happen. In fact, Robin Emsley calculates that one in six relapses in psychosis eventually become completely resistant to treatment. So patients become treatment resistant when they relapse. So the recurrences that you see, the relapses that you see indicate some kind of progression here uh, and deterioration here. So what we saw from uh, Wilhelm Greisinger's uh, quote is probably true, uh, even with modern data with antipsychotics. Now this is Stefan Leuk's meta-analysis here um, the very uh, easily observable fact here is the difference between people who are treated and people who are on placebo. In other words, in our practice, these are patients who accept antipsychotics and the patients who either not accept or stop after a while. So all in blue are the relapse rates of people who stay on the treatment. And what you see in green is the relapse rate for people who are on placebo. These are all randomized control trials. So when people are taking the medications, they're actually taking um, and there are ways in which uh, complaints has been ensured in these trials. So despite taking antipsychotics uh, in the first year, uh, you have 27% of relapse. And if you don't take antipsychotics, this is very well known, the relapse is very high, it's 64%. Um, what about year two and year three in terms of maintenance treatment? If you come off the medication uh, year two and year three, despite staying on it in the first year, uh, uh, the placebo maintenance people, uh, they are on 79% of relapse rate. 
uh, for people who continue to take antipsychotics, they're not fully out of woods, they still relapse. And nearly half of them, 44% of them relapse despite taking antipsychotics. Now, I, I'm not very focused on the difference between the blue and green, but I want you to see the, the, the progression between year one and year two and three. No matter whether you take antipsychotics or not, can you see the, the skyscrapers, the Man Manhattan buildings are going up further. So 27 becomes 44, 64 becomes uh, 79. So clearly um, this is a condition which is not, whatever the process is, the progressive process is that's happening over the years, uh, that process, that condition is not completely reversed by antipsychotics that we use. Uh, the underlying progression still happens. So um, Reisinger was, was right. There is a progressive pathology. We don't know what that is. So what is the mechanistic basis? What is happening in the brain to explain this progression? Um, well, we don't know is the simplest answer for this, but for a long time, uh, the suspect, uh, one of the suspects has been progressive structural changes that happens in the brain. So over time, there is a degree of tissue loss in the brain. And a lot of people have blamed the tissue loss for uh, the progression in psychosis. And it started with this man, uh, Emil Krepelin, uh, who well, he's the reason for many of our problems, uh, starting from diagnostic classifications. But uh, Krepelin, because he observed patients repeatedly over time, um, he was able to come up with morphological classification systems. And he actually was very convinced there is some sort of brain problem happening. At least at some point in his life, he thought uh, there is a brain-related issue. In fact, he uh, sourced color plates, as uh, uh, drawing plates from uh, Alois Alzheimer, who was working with brain cells and pathology at the time, and he included those plates, illustrations in his uh, textbook. So he was very key, convinced that there's a brain, brain basis for what's happening in what he called as dementia precox. Uh, and this is what he says, uh, we are dealing with, he's talking about dementia precox, schizophrenia. So he says, we are dealing with serious and only partially reversible damage to the cerebral cortex. 75% of cases reach higher grades of dementia and they sink deeper and deeper. Now, this is very pessimistic. Uh, unfortunately, Emil Krepelin's view uh, was such uh, that he, he didn't uh, expect the condition to improve greatly in a large number of patients. <clears throat> is that still true? Uh, this is our own Patrick McGurry, who, as you know, uh, a lot of us regard as uh, someone who initiated the, uh, the interest in early intervention in recent times. Um, so uh, Patrick McGurry's statement to BBR Foundation, to NARSID, in one of the interviews in 2018, um, says damage is done uh, to the brain and to the person if proper treatment is not begun at the very beginning. So there is this ingrained idea that there's a brain damage if we don't intervene early. Uh, and this is also held by uh, Jeff Lieberman. This is his recent appraisal of the need for early intervention in American Journal of Psychiatry. He says active psychosis, in, in fact, is bad for the brain uh, in that it reflects underlying pathophysiological process. So um, there is a very strong uh, underlying current here in early intervention movement that uh, toxicity to brain happens if you don't intervene early. So we've got to jump in and treat patients uh, to prevent brain damage. And this is not only uh, limited to psychosis. You see any early intervention movement, almost any disorder, uh, the early intervention movement talks about this concept of neuroprogression and how illness trajectories match with neuroprogression. And one of, the one of the reasons, one of the issues that is put in front of early intervention movement is we need to stop this brain damage. And this is for OCD, this is for bipolar disorder. So it's, it's a very deeply ingrained concept. Uh, let's ask three questions about this concept now. Let's, uh, let's see if this is true. Should we hold this idea in our mind? Number one, is there a progressive brain tissue loss in schizophrenia? Number two, uh, do antipsychotic interventions reverse this neuroprogression? Are we doing the right thing? If there is a progressive pathology, are we reversing it by the treatments that we give? I'm limiting myself to antipsychotics. I know a lot of you treat patients psychological, uh, psychologically, um, either uh, as an adjunct or on its own but I'm limiting myself to this because most body of work has been done on the effect of antipsychotics on neuroprogression. Third, does neuroprogression indicate an unfavorable outcome? It's an important question. If there is something happening in the brain, does it mean it's bad for the person? So let's ask these three questions and see if we have to continue with this idea of uh, progression, neuroprogression as the mechanistic focus of early intervention. Now, uh, a lot of work has been done on looking at what happens to the brain on a longitudinal fashion uh, within early psychotic samples. A um, number of people have uh, followed up patients for times varying from 12 weeks to uh, 10 years even, and they've observed what happens to the brain. Now, I've summarized this in a recent review, well, not recent anymore, it's four years old, in, a, in Neuroscience and Biobehavioral Review. 
So uh, the, the, the juice of all of that is, yes, there is a progressive gray matter change that happens in schizophrenia. It's a longitudinal change. So it happens from the first episode onwards. There is a progressive change. And this change is, is not everywhere in the brain. It is spatially constrained. And the picture here shows you the, the areas which are mostly affected by this, uh, let's say, shrinkage of the brain. And uh, this is uh, anterior cingulate uh, here in blue, uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, uh, insula, as well as the superior temporal cortex. These are hub regions of the brain. And this is where most of the progressive reduction is focused. Uh, but the good news is this reduction seems to be temporally constrained as well, by which I mean this loss happens intensely only for a few years of the illness. And after that, it plateaus. There is no further uh, increased rate of change compared to healthy controls. And the amount of change itself is of modest magnitude. Uh, it's very small. So these are the uh, three important observations. Uh, there is neuroprogression, but it's limited. Uh, so what happens, you know, if you look at a, a brain of a patient who, is, uh, uh, who has an established case of schizophrenia, so this is a, a old meta-analysis. It's now 15 years old. This is from Chris Davidzokis. Uh, what you see here is a, a map on the brain template of various areas of brain where you see loss of tissue. Now, an interesting observation here is it's distributed, but it's concentrated. The, 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 red, the more red the, um, the spot is, the more tissue loss happens there. And you can see, as I said, it's ACC, the insula here, and also the superior temporal gyrus region here. Um, you can see here. So those are the regions which <clears throat> show reduction. But interestingly here, uh, you can also see some blue spots. And these blue spots are regions which show higher gray matter than healthy controls. Now that's an interesting observation. So there's not just a unidirectional one-way traffic here. It's not just loss of tissue. There is some gain of tissue. We got very interested in this and we wanted to pursue this further. Is there, a, is there an increase in tissue that's happening in addition to decrease in tissue in schizophrenia? So we've done a series of uh, uh, you know, studies on this, but I want to focus on a couple of uh, work showing that it's, it's not always a loss. There's, a, there's some gain as well. The very first question we wanted to answer was, if there is a tissue gain, does that happen in the same areas where there is tissue loss? If it happens in the same areas where there was tissue loss, it might indicate there is a process of regeneration or amelioration or some sort of normalization in some sense. So this is a Shushia Go. She's a, a, in Shangsha. She's a mathematician, applied mathematician. So she looked at um, some interesting uh, models of um, tissue loss. Uh, and she came up with this observation. This is based on data that we collected in the UK, in Nottingham at the time, around uh, 98 patients and 83 healthy controls. We looked at cortical thickness and we deliberately chose a sample which had a wide dispersion of duration so that we can use uh, age or duration of illness as a proxy for what happens over the stages of uh, psychosis. Now here, what you see in this picture is a bit complex, but I'll try and explain this. Um, on the y-axis, on this vertical axis, uh, you see three values, zero, minus one, and one. If it is zero, there is no difference between patients and controls. Uh, if it is one, then patients have a tissue loss. And if it is minus one, then patients have a tissue gain in that area. Now, what you see over time, if you look at time bins of duration, these are the three areas of the brain which showed a maximum thickness reduction in our sample. Uh, so in this picture here, the bar charts here, you see red is patients and blue is healthy controls. And there are many regions which are showing re reduced values in, uh, in the red group, the patient group. So these are the regions. We chose three of them, the top three of them, and we wanted to see what happens over time in those regions. Now, what's happening over time, as you can see, the, my, the, 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 the one moves closer to zero. In other words, whatever difference that was there in the early years of illness seems to uh, close the gap and, and come to a point of zero uh, in those brain areas. So the most affected areas are showing some uh, pattern of escape or, or compensation to come back. So this was an observation that we uh, was very fascinated with. We thought it's all one way uh, progressive tissue loss, but it looks like it is not the case. There is some uh, healing effect that happens in the brain in, in patients with schizophrenia. Now, this was more beautifully demonstrated uh, by uh, in a recent work by uh, Zalaski's group in Australia, in Melbourne. Uh, this was uh, led by Lev, uh, Julian Lev. It's a very interesting piece of work. Uh, again, complex, but I'll try and explain this. It's a very large data set, around 500 people. So um, this, this group, they said, let's find out, let's define normality and then see how many patients are outside the normality gap. 
So they define normality as uh, take a huge number of healthy controls, measure the uh, cortical thickness in each area of the brain, uh, and then <clears throat> put a cutoff, five to 95% cutoff as the bounds of normality. So if there is a patient that falls above 95%, you can say that area is supranormal for that person, supranormal, more thickness. And if they fall below 5%, you can say that that brain region is infranormal. So let's count how many, how many areas of brain are supranormal and how many are infranormal in schizophrenia. What they found out was fascinating. They found out that, uh, yes, there is tissue loss in schizophrenia. 79% of patients show at least one brain region that are, that are infranormal compared to healthy people. But 46%, nearly half of them, also show supranormal deviations. Uh, they, they have levels higher than healthy controls uh, in, uh, in at least one brain region, and that's 46% of them. This is remarkable. And they found out that for any given region of brain, 82% of patients were having levels within normal limits. They were not deviant, 82% of patients. Most patients that we see in our clinic will have normal brain tissue for most brain regions. And uh, the, the catch though is this is not the same between two patients. So what you see on the bottom here is two different patients and uh, everything in blue is uh, areas of tissue loss. Everything in, uh, in yellow or red is areas of tissue gain. And this is patient number one. You can see they have a lot of uh, infra normal deviations. They don't have any gain. But here you see uh, patient number two, they have very little infra normal, uh, but they also have a supra normal deviation here. Um, so this is this color map is just an average summary of all of these, and it shows you that um, uh, for every area of brain that, where there's tissue loss, there's also areas of brain where there is tissue gain in uh, schizophrenia. Now this is not a single observation; it's not just our study and Zalaski study. Uh, there are a series of other observations that support the idea that brain is mostly normal in patients with schizophrenia when it comes to brain structure. Very few show deviations, and this is from. Thomas Wolfer's group in, uh, in Norway, and they have now replicated uh, 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 extensive observation they did three years ago, showing most patients have normal brain uh, when they have schizophrenia or bipolar disorder for that matter. So this is a very important uh, fact to keep in mind. So there is some tissue gain. Now, when does that start? Does it start after you start treatment or does it start as soon as the tissue loss begins? This is an important question because we need to know if uh, the, the healing process, what we think is healing process, or compensation process, is it triggered by treatments we give? Or does it happen as a natural uh, balancing act? So this was done by, this is a work done by, um, this is Mingli Lee. She was an exchange student for a year with us here in London. She came from uh, Chengdu in um, China. Uh, she's an MD, PhD as well. So she uh, brought a very interesting set of data with her. Um, you know, this is very, uh, difficult to do here in Canada or the US, uh, collecting completely antipsychotic naive patients, making them uh, you know, go for a scan before uh, you start treatment on them. Uh, for some, you know, by, by using um, a, a very large team of people, a number of psychiatrists being involved in referring patients, over 10 years, they managed to collect a sample of 685 people. 343 of them were first episode patients without a single drop of antipsychotic ever given to them. And they scanned them, the morning before they started the treatment in the afternoon. So these patients had completely antipsychotic naive brain scans. So we asked the question, uh, do they have brain tissue loss? Do they also have brain tissue gain uh, compared to healthy controls? So what we saw was uh, when we did com independent component analysis, this is a method to reduce the amount of data into meaningful components. What we saw was uh, there were a number of brain regions, yellow and red are two different components, number of brain regions showing decreased gray matter concentration in schizophrenia. No surprise, this has been shown in many studies. But we also saw one single component which involved uh, many areas which were not too far away from the areas showing reduced tissue. So these are, uh, the blue bits are areas of brain which show increased tissue at the same time you see decreased tissue compared to healthy controls. And this, this increase in tissue was related to shorter DUP. So people who come quickly to treatment seem to have more gain in their brain tissue. And it's also related to having less severe symptoms, less severe positive symptoms, and better performance in executive uh, tests. So whatever this phenomena is, this is helping to some extent uh, to, uh, for the patient group to have less symptoms and have better cognitive set shifting ability. Now, we cannot make any causal conclusions. We cannot say increase in tissue is the reason why they do better, but uh, these things seem to go together. There is an association here.
Um, so this paper is under review at the moment, but uh, it's an important observation. <clears throat> so uh, tissue gain happens in addition to tissue loss. Tissue gain does not happen because we give antipsychotics. It seems to happen even before we start treatment. Now, what about after you start antipsychotics? Does it actually help with this process of increasing brain tissue or does it contribute to neuroprogression? Now, most of you might have seen this work from Nancy Andreessen's group, caused a lot of ripples some years ago. The ripples are still felt. Uh, this is a work which showed if you classify, if you follow up patients with uh, early psychosis for over seven to eight years and uh, classify them according to the amount of antipsychotics they're exposed to, you classify them into the highly treated group, high dose of antipsychotics, the least treated group, and the intermediate treatment group. So the highly treated group is in red, and the, uh, the least treated group is in purple, and the green here is the intermediate treatment, average amount of antipsychotics. Now, if you see what happens over the years, there is a, a small but notable loss of volume in people who receive the highest dose of antipsychotics. Now, this was alarming because, um, you know, we, we believe we are treating patients uh, with all, all aspects of psychosis, but it looks like when we treat patients with higher doses of antipsychotics, they're actually losing brain tissue. Uh, in fact, Nancy Andreessen concluded that it is possible, although antipsychotics relieve psychosis and the suffering associated with it, these drugs may not arrest the pathophysiological process underlying schizophrenia. They may even aggravate the process, uh, she believes. So this is uh, really alarming and concerning for us. But uh, you know, these kind of studies do not really um, separate whether the tissue loss relates to having highly severe symptoms or receiving highly severe, you know, high doses of antipsychotics. Because in practice, when somebody is more symptomatic, you increase the dose or you add more antipsychotics to their uh, profile. So, you know, the study doesn't really dissociate that. It's very difficult to disentangle these two features. But there are some interesting samples coming up now, uh, which uh, allows us to answer at least partly some of these questions. Now, this is again one of these very rare samples that we cannot collect uh, from most parts of the world. Um, in China, in Midland China, in rural China, um, some um, a research group in uh, uh, Midland China managed to collect 35 patients who were never treated with antipsychotics for 20 years. So this is 20 years of schizophrenia, but never been exposed to antipsychotics. This is remarkably difficult to collect. So they compared those never treated, 20 year never treated patients with 20 patients who received risperidone and 20 patients who received clozapin, each of them being on them for five years at least. Uh, so very selected sample. And they wanted to see if um, neuroleptic naive patients showed most, anti most brain tissue loss or is it the treated patients who showed most brain tissue loss? Uh, now here, NT means not treated, never treated, and uh, HT is healthy control, uh, RT is risperidone treated, and uh, CT is clozapine treated. Now what you see here is never treated patients compared to healthy controls, yes, they do show a brain tissue loss. This is a thickness a reduction in two areas of the brain, frontal and temporal. Uh, but when you see risperidone treated people who had same duration of illness, for, for around five years, they're treated with risperidone. They're actually showing more extensive tissue reduction compared to healthy controls. So the, the reduction here is more widespread than the never treated group. And interestingly, you know, you will see the, the never treated group when you compare them head to head, uh, you'll see the, the never treated group also has a tissue gain. It's also present in the risperidone treated group, but uh, you know, even without antipsychotics, as I said before, uh, even without antipsychotics, there is a tissue gain that you see in never treated group. So uh, what can you conclude? There is, um, there is an effect that antipsychotics have. Uh, antipsychotics affect the brain tissue more than illness duration itself. This is, a, this is clear from this particular study. Again, this is observational, not experimental, so you can only make um, conclusions with a reasonable amount of doubt. But this is a randomized control trial. This was done recently. Uh, it was published only two weeks ago uh, in neuropsych pharmacology. This is a study done, uh, led by uh, uh, colleagues and uh, collaborators in, um, um, in Australia. This was primarily uh, led by Sidan Chopra uh, using uh, data they collected from stages RCT in Melbourne. Um, in this particular um, study, uh, they, random, they randomized uh, first episode patients to either receive placebo and social interventions plus uh, in one, one arm, the other arm, antipsychotics plus social interventions. So they wanted to see what happens uh, in a randomized control setting. Uh, is there any brain tissue loss that's introduced by antipsychotic use? Now, you know, this is a bit of a complicated design, but uh, please look at this, the, the plots here. You have three groups, PIPT, MIPT, and healthy control. PIPT is the uh, placebo-treated group, 
and MIPT is the medication treated group and uh, healthy controls, of course. They're all observed for 12 months in total, uh, longitudinal follow-up, three scans have been done, zero, three months, and 12 months. And what you see here is uh, in the placebo-treated group who are psychotic, uh, first episode psychosis, they show a, a loss of brain tissue um, in the first three months. And this happens in this area, basal ganglia, a, a small spot. Most of the brain, of, by the way, most of the brain was normal, whether you receive antipsychotics or not in uh, first episode psychosis. Uh, but there was a small piece of tissue here which showed a, a reduction uh, when you don't give antipsychotics. The same area showed a gain in tissue when antipsychotics were given. But the patients were treated with antipsychotics for a longer period. They were treated for nearly one year. So what happens over time? Is this gain sustained? Does it, does it stay as a gain? No, it doesn't. The, the antipsychotic treated group, after the third month, when they are observed at the 12th month, they don't show the, the difference anymore. Same way, the people who did not receive antipsychotics, the placebo group, they gain back over time. So whatever happens seem to be a short-lived effect of antipsychotics. It seem to be, that doesn't seem to be a sustained effect in terms of uh, gray matter changes. This is a randomized control experiment. So uh, this is more, uh, you can make more causal conclusions here compared to some of the previous observations, but it tells the same story. Antipsychotics do affect the brain structure, um, but they don't seem to uh, contribute to a sustained gain in brain tissue in any way. Uh, and in longer time, more than 12 months, and in higher doses, uh, they may even contribute to tissue loss. So is that bad then if you lose a bit of the sh tissue? Should you worry? Remember, most of us, when we grow old, we lose brain tissue, but we get wiser. I think at least uh, we can believe we get wiser. So that's an optimistic belief. So neuroprogression doesn't, you know, uh, brain tissue loss itself doesn't need to be a negative thing. But what about when people with psychosis lose brain tissue? Does it mean they're going to have unfavorable outcome? Generally speaking, uh, what you see with in these studies is there is a drop, a progressive tissue loss, but the symptoms don't track those tissue losses. In other words, people get better with symptoms, but gray matter seems to come down. So there is no correlation in most of the studies between what happens to symptoms and function and what happens to brain tissue. It's a very important observation. And this is well exemplified if you look at clozapin. Clozapin, as you know, is one of the most effective antipsychotics, whether you use it at first episode or later on. But if you compare all the antipsychotics and ask the question, which antipsychotic has shown a consistent loss of tissue uh, patterns in the brain, clozapin seems to be associated with higher degree of tissue loss. Uh, but still, it's one treatment that works very well. So we cannot simply match tissue loss with functional loss or symptomatic worsening. Uh, these phenomena seem to be not correlated. Also, another problem in making causal conclusions is the idea of the issue of reverse causality. It's not that uh, loss of tissue uh, is related to outcome. Outcome itself may affect the tissue, uh, amount of brain tissue. And this is uh, beautifully demonstrated if you look at studies outside of psychosis. If you look at um, uh, depression, for example, uh, there is a correlation between number of depressive relapses you have and the amount of brain tissue loss, gray matter loss. This was shown by Zaramba and group from Spain in the JAMA psychiatry three years ago. Also uh, recently, Martin Lapage from uh, Montreal, McGill, published a paper on schizophrenia blood in open, showing that the amount of time people remain psychotic despite treatment, uh, in other words, the, the duration of unremitted psychosis correlates with tissue loss. So the more symptomatic you remain, the more tissue loss you're going to have. It's not the otherwise other way around um, in terms of neuroprogression. So uh, the three questions that I raised, uh, is there any answer now we can have for that? Yes. Is there a progressive tissue loss in schizophrenia? Yes, there is but this loss is limited and both loss and gain occur in our patients. Do antipsychotic interventions reverse neuroprogression? Unfortunately, no. In fact, tissue reduction seems to be higher with even therapeutic doses of antipsychotics. Does neuroprogression indicate an unfavorable outcome? No. Tissue reduction and increase, both of these occur alongside a demonstrable efficacy of treatment. People get better, but tissue changes occur and underneath that. Uh, so we cannot, and also there is reverse causality. So we cannot say loss of tissue means uh, bad for the patient. Now, this is also again uh, exemplified by one other uh, paper. This is uh, Pan Yunzu. Uh, he, he, he was a PhD student. Uh, he spent a year with us um, in London before he went back to Changsha, where he came from. Uh, Pan, uh, you know, when he came, he brought a data set with him and he said, uh, you know, he calls me Dr. P. He said, Dr. P, I don't 
Uh, I don't believe there is this two groups of people, patients with schizophrenia and patients without schizophrenia. So I'm going to put all my scans in one box. And I'm going to ask the computer to find out if the brains are separable in any way based on the brain structure. I wasn't very happy. You know, I'm a psychiatrist. I believe there is schizophrenia or there is psychosis. Uh, so I, didn't, uh, I wasn't very enthusiastic, but he did that uh, nevertheless. Uh, and interestingly, we didn't have a two-way ca classification. We didn't have um, the computer telling us there is a group of people with schizophrenia and a group of people with uh, you know, no schizophrenia. Instead, we had three clusters, cluster one, two, and three at the end of this classification procedure. Um, and interestingly, um, cluster one was the only group that had mostly patients. There was like 2% of the cluster one was healthy people. Most of them were patients. The other two clusters had equal, more or less equal amount of patients and healthy controls. Uh, and most of the patients, he had 180, 179 patients scans with him. Most patients uh, were close to healthy controls. They were either in cluster two or three. Cluster one only had 46 patients out of 179. So uh, what you can conclude here is, of course, there were difference in thickness. Uh, there were some areas which were thin, some areas that were thick in the cluster one compared to other clusters. Uh, the cluster one was the morphologically impoverished group, and most people in that group was a patient with schizophrenia. But most patients with schizophrenia did not go into that group. So what can you conclude here is, you know, if you close your eyes and randomly uh, tick the box for one of the patients coming into your clinic, it's very likely that patient will have a brain structure very similar to yours or mine. Uh, people who don't have schizophrenia. So uh, this is an important observation and it's, uh, it's uh, confirmed by uh, the previous studies that I have highlighted. So this whole idea of neuroprogression uh, in, in that editorial I recently wrote, in the commentary I recently wrote, I, I, I invoke this, this uh, bedtime story of uh, the headless horseman, this, the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Neuroprogression seems to be the headless horseman story of psychosis. Why do I say that? Because you know, most of us seem to be afraid of brain tissue changes. Uh, we tell each other that there's going to be brain tissue loss and you want to treat patients early because of that. And patients want to stop the treatment because they're worried antipsychotics will cause brain tissue loss. But all of this turns out to be this, uh, this big legend about headless horseman. Nobody has seen him, but everybody believes he exists and they're afraid of, each, afraid of him coming and attacking him. So uh, you know, this is the uh, state of affairs at the moment. Uh, there's very little neuroprogression, if any. So in our group, we don't call this as neuroprogression when you see brain structural changes. Uh, we have a series of papers uh, in the last few years uh, where we emphasize the idea that any changes that you see in brain in schizophrenia uh, is, a, is a reorganization process or a neuroadaptation process, not a progressive tissue loss. Why do we call it neuro reorganization? Because we think there is a purpose to this change that you see in the brain structure. The purpose may be compensatory to make up for the deficits the patients have early on. And this may be the reason why most of these changes happen in the first few years when the deficits are maximal um, and uh, they relate to um, uh, outcome changes over time. So we, 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 you know, our idea is um, we cannot say there is a brain damage associated with schizophrenia anymore. Of course, there are brain changes and those are reorganization or adaptive, adaptive changes. Now, this is one slide I really want to show before I close the talk. <coughs> now, I, I emphasize the idea <clears throat> that we cannot think of brain tissue loss uh, as, uh, as a negative event. And this is a study uh, which was done by um, uh, a group uh, led by Hoke Zimmer uh, it was published in uh, Niche Neuroscience three years ago. Fantastic study. They looked at pregnant women uh, before they became pregnant, and they scanned them after they delivered the child. Um, and what they saw was pregnancy was associated with a significant amount of gray matter shrinkage. Significant amount of tissue loss was happening in these 24 women who were scanned before and after. And this tissue loss was happening in the brain areas uh, which are important for cognitive processing, the DMN areas, the default mode network areas, and also the temporal cortex areas. All of these areas are important for theory of mind, how you process information from other people. And interestingly, they showed that this loss was not negative for these women. Um, those who had higher degree of tissue loss were the ones who showed better bonding and better attachment behavior with the, with the children, with the infants that were born. So this is the relationship between the attachment bonding score and amount of loss, tissue loss that these women had. Now, you know, you might think this is an unusual phenomena. People who are pregnant look after themselves in a different way. And, and you know, a lot of physiological changes happen. So this is, this is just a transient phenomenon, you might think. But they followed up these, patient, these uh, pregnant women 
after they delivered the children, postpartum follow-up, two years after, and they had 11 of them who came for such a follow-up. And what you see here is each brain area that I show here, each of them show a steep decline during pregnancy. And did they, get, did they come back to the pre-pregnancy levels? They don't seem to be. So these women still have less gray matter than what they started with. And they're doing beautifully well. They're happy families, uh, you know, uh, uh, functional mothers and functional children, no deficits, uh, and, and they carry the gray matter uh, shrinkage in the brain. So we need to apply, we need to see the gray matter loss in our patients through the same lens, I believe. Gray matter loss could be physiological and adaptive, at least for some patients that we see in our practice. So, you know, this is all uh, leading us to think that there is we talk about antipsychotics, we talk about external and external agents. These are pills that we give and then antipsychotics. We generally don't talk about intrinsic antipsychotic defense processes. But you know, all these observations I'm, I'm telling you here, how the brain reorganizes itself, to me, it speaks of an intrinsic antipsychotic defense process. We generally think of moving from pathophysiology to clinical symptoms and try to break this link. But I think it's time we also think about how symptom expression affects the brain and what can we understand about reparatory compensatory processes? And could this be the better mechanistic basis of early intervention in the future? In that way, we could find true early interventions, not just transposing interventions that we use currently. Um, and this is, this is some of the magnetic resonance spectroscopy studies that uh, we've done recently in, in our um, group here in London, Ontario. This is Cara Dempster. Uh, this is Roberto Limongi. Uh, Kara was a physician scientist. She's now working in Dalhousie. Uh, you know, we've been focused on uh, antioxidants, especially the thing called glutathione in the brain, which is a central antioxidant. And what we have observed in the recent times is uh, in early psychosis, in first episode psychosis, patients seem to have higher amount of glutathione. And the higher they have, the quicker they respond to antipsychotics. So this was published in Molecular Psychiatry last year higher antioxidant levels in the prefrontal cortex, ACC, anterior cingulate cortex, that relates to quicker and larger magnitude of response. So perhaps patients are mounting a response to the, the episode of psychosis, and the better they mount that response, the, the better their outcomes are. And in fact, uh, Roberto Limongi followed this up. He's a, a senior research fellow in the group. He followed this up and he showed um, you know, how glutamatergic ex ex uh, excitation is negative to the brain. So there is a story here higher the amount of glutamate, more the brain tissue loss in many conditions. Glutamate is excitotoxic. So what Roberto Limongi showed is higher the glutamate levels, higher the glutathione levels as well in our patients. And higher the glutathione levels, uh, the lesser the negative impact of glutamate on connectivity within the brain. So high glutamate means hyperconnectivity and tissue damage. Glutathione seem to be counteracting it. In, you know, I'm, I'm saying I'm putting this forward here to, to tell you that the intrinsic antipsychotic defense mechanism, defense process, may already be operating in number of our patients. We've just started to uncover this and, and started to understand the antioxidant system to, to some extent, and we believe uh, this might open the door for uh, different ways of early intervention in the future. So to conclude, structural changes in the brain, they do not inform decisions regarding currently available treatments. Uh, both for initiating, starting the antipsychotic as well as cessation. I think the claim that your brain is going to shrink if you don't take antipsychotics, if you don't take early intervention, is not tenable anymore. Uh, same way, patients, if they come and tell us, look, I, I read Nancy Andreessen's paper, I think my brain may be shrinking if I continue to take antipsychotics. Please stop my drugs, stop my medications. I think that is also not, uh, not true because whatever happens, uh, you know, if the uh, the, the neuroprogression doesn't seem to be related to antipsychotic effects very much. And number two, uh, if patients stop treatment and if they relapse, the relapses itself will shrink the brain, unfortunately, to a greater extent in early stages of psychosis. Um, so in terms of mechanistic basis for you know, the latecomers finality and loss of capital problem, uh, we are pursuing the antioxidant system for this. Uh, very early days to say anything about how differently can we intervene early, but I think uh, the idea uh, is promising for us. Uh, th there is uh, a system here which links developmental irregularities with treatment response, uh, and this could be reset in some ways in some patients. This is London, Ontario. Uh, we just had uh, all the snow disappearing yesterday. We had a 20 degree day. Uh, this is this is our city. Thank you very much for, for attending this talk. Well, thank you for a wonderful presentation here. We've had a couple questions come in already, but uh, people can still continue to submit questions and in the chat as we start going over the initial ones here. Uh, the first question for you is, 
There's some data suggesting that second generation antipsychotics can lead to gray matter increases. Yep. How does this data uh, relate to the data you presented here? And are the regions that may increase in gray matter due to second generation antipsychotics different from those that may be increasing in size naturally over the course of illness progression? That's a great question. Um, there are differences among antipsychotics in terms of um, what happens with brain tissue. Uh, in fact, the, the stages RCT from uh, Melbourne group, from Patrick McGarry's group, um, they primarily use second generation antipsychotic to treat uh, the first episode psychosis. And they showed, you know, the, initially there is an uh, increase in basal ganglia volume, but over time it wasn't sustained. Now, my own take on this is uh, if you ask the question, what matters? Is it the type of antipsychotic? or is it the amount of dose and duration of exposure? It seems to be the, the negative effects, the deleterious effects in terms of brain tissue uh, seems to be related more to the dose exposure as well as the duration of treatment rather than uh, the type of antipsychotics. If you look at meta-analysis, it looks like there is a difference between first generation and second generation, um, but it's complicated also by the fact uh, that the times have changed and you know, recent times we intervene early and we use mostly second generation antipsychotics. Um, so, you know, that, that difference is not usually uh, passed in meta-analytical setting. Number two, um, these days, uh, typicals are used mostly when patients don't respond to atypicals. So you're already dealing with more severe, uh, you know, illness uh, when you introduce uh, typical antipsychotics. So how does that interact then with tissue loss is a big question. We don't know the answer for that. Great. The, uh, the next question that came in um, is asking you maybe to, to speculate a little bit here. So if not uh, loss of gray matter over illness, what biological mechanisms may be relevant to the course of psychosis? Yeah, this is a great question. There are many pieces here uh, in this puzzle, right? Uh, I don't think I have one answer for it, but uh, I'm, I'm really intrigued by... Um, uh, you know, some of the uh, recent observations in terms of um, uh, astrocyte microglial involvement um, in, in psychosis. Uh, you know, astrocytes, microglia, all the different cellular types, uh, they're all part, you know, components in this homeostatic parcel that we have, how the brain adjusts itself for different damages inflicted on it. And, and these cellular systems uh, in some way try to uh, compensate or try to overcome uh, the issues that you know uh, uh, an individual faces developmentally. I do think there are developmental structural changes, uh, which probably may be stigmata of what happened um, to the individual early on in the life, and that might later link with the risk of psychosis. For example, we are very interested in gyrification, cortical folding in the brain. Um, folding is more or less like fingerprints. Uh, they are established by you know two years of your life. Uh, you have very little change later on. That's why you know Apple and Google, all of them believe in our fingerprints. Um, so the, the the issue though is um, cortical folding changes uh, seem to be really small in effect. Uh, you know most patients have normal patterns of cortical folding as well. So there may be a subgroup of patients who are developmentally loaded uh, in terms of early life structural lesions, uh, which later increases the risk. But you know development is as a canalized process by which I mean whatever disruptions happens early on, uh, there is time to catch up and, and, and canalize and bring it to uh, a range of normalcy. So most of us uh, withstand the damage that happens early and we, we bring ourselves into this uh, wide range of what is called normalcy with variations. But the, the compensatory changes that happens because of developmental insults may sometimes be very maladaptive. Uh, I don't think we understand these compensation processes very well. So when I talk about compensation, it's not just compensation to symptoms, compensation to risk factors as well, early risk factors as well. And I think, you know, if we, if we start uh, looking at brain structure in, a, in that way, rather than degeneration, dementia, precox, and progression idea, uh, we may be able to uh, hit the answers there. But, you know, it's early days to say what mechanism explains everything that we see in, uh, in schizophrenia. The next question is, um, can cortical reorganization explain any of the functional changes that we see in psychosis, things like hypofrontality? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And we are very interested in this. We're pursuing what are the functional implications of this reorganization. So um, one way in which we study this is um, using functional imaging. You know, we, uh, 
we try to use graph theory, uh, which gives you a, a systemic understanding of the brain instead of thinking of brain parts as uh, parts that exist uh, you know, in, a, in a mechanical setup, uh, graph theory allows you to see how these components interact with each other. In other, ways, in other, in other words, it tells you how the car runs. Uh, it doesn't tell you much about what the wheel is made of, but it tells you how the car actually functions. Um, so uh, when you use graph theory, when you use functional imaging, uh, you get the idea what happens when one hub of the brain is, is hit. In other words, you know, imagine Graph theory is a bit like how you um, how you see uh, traffic maps, uh, air, air traffic maps, airline maps. When you look at any any of these uh, pictures of how airports are connected, there will be some airports which are very busy hubs, and some will be you know less busy, and not not so much traffic. Now, what we see when we use the same principle of hub connections in the brain in functional imaging is when in psychosis, when a, a major hub is hit when it's not functioning, when it's not very well connected. There are some peripheral hubs which seem to be picking up some of this connectivity load from the central hubs. Now, when they pick up that kind of function, uh, some unwanted effects happen. We recently published a, a paper showing that the formal thought disorder, disorganization that you see in acute psychosis may be related to some peripheral hubs which have no function in language, now picking up um, the, the language load when the language hubs start deteriorating in terms of progressive changes. So we do think reorganization has functional consequences. There is some symptom relationships that we see. Hypofrontality uh, may be you know, one such uh, effect because of reorganization. You know, why do I say that? Because when you look at task processing data in uh, schizophrenia, uh, hypofrontality seems to be not just complete loss of frontal function, but sometimes you see excessive recruitment of certain frontal tissue. Uh, and, and that excessive recruitment is inefficient. It doesn't compensate enough to do the task, but there seems to be higher recruitment than what is needed. So this could also be an, uh, an evidence of compensation that happens in the brain uh, when some hubs do not function very well. Uh, so you know, it's a great question. We don't know fully what is the functional consequences of reorganization, but we see some evidence that it relates to symptoms and it also relates to uh, effects of what we see in task processing studies in fMRI. So I think we have time for one last question here. Uh, for this question, uh, it is, uh, how does the overall treatment provided by an early psychosis program, interventions like psychiatry, psychotherapy, peer support, et cetera, uh, relate to the brain outcomes that you've talked about today? I think, you know, this is, uh, this is a tough question to answer for a couple of reasons. One is um, we're talking about um, the, 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 the overall package of intervention that we give to patients. Uh, what we need is um, a set of patients who never received that package and a set of patients who did go through it and see what are the differences in, uh, in terms of um, brain findings in these patients. I don't think we have any studies like that done. Um, I mean, there are some studies where um, you have some brain imaging data collected uh, in, uh, in people who receive treatment versus not, not receiving treatment. But these observational studies do not uh, equate to having a, a complete package of early intervention given and denied to, to groups. And I think it's very, very challenging to uh, do something like that. I mean, all I can say uh, is outcomes differ, uh, right, with early intervention. Patients die less. Um, patients do stay well for longer. Um, patients have less admissions to the hospital. And the, the, the repeated episodes of functional deterioration seems to be limited, uh, arrested in some sense by intervening early and having a person for them to, to contact when they are in crisis. Uh, and that does have an effect, positive effect on, on the brain. Now, is that demonstrated clearly yet? Uh, I would say probably not, uh, but I believe with, with those kind of proxy observations, uh, the package of early intervention does preserve uh, brain tissue to some extent. Well, great. Well, uh, Dr. Palaniopin, many thanks for a wonderful presentation here today. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we hope you all can join us next week when we will have uh, Dr. Janice Jenkins presenting on her ethnographic research on the subjective experience of stigma and recovery uh, in early psychosis. So hope everyone continues to stay well and hope we will see many of you with us next week. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much for having me.